Hello everybody, it's great to be with you in Ohio, in Columbus, my hometown. And today we're going to talk about uh, maximizing executive performance. So before we get into that, just a little bit about who I am. I'm Scott McClemens, uh, a longtime banking executive uh, turned consultant. The name of my firm is CEO Velocity Consulting. I'm located in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I specialize in leadership systems and analytics. So the last presentation, we talked about uh, a system which consisted of leadership, people, and systems. In this presentation, we're gonna focus specifically on your executive team and how you, as volunteers, can hold them accountable. That's the whole theme of what we're doing today is, is giving you all tools as volunteers to hold your executive team accountable. So let's just dive in. And as always, if you have questions, just stop me and we'll take care of them. So we're going to talk about that why do we need high-performing executives and something that I call the epidemic at the top. That'll uh, uh, be kind of interesting. Some growth principles. We'll talk about the main body of the presentation, six ways to maximize executive performance, and uh, go on to talk about CEOs and how you can hold your, your CEOs accountable. So let's get started. Your executive team is the engine of your credit union. They affect everything. So we're talking chief operating officer, CEO, CIO, whoever's on your executive team, you can see that they impact so much. Their members, the identity of your credit union, some of the things we talked about previously, strategy, members, um, strategic marketing, there's nothing that your executive team doesn't touch in your credit union, and that's why your oversight of them is so important. So what best describes your executive team? Are they engaged? Are they energized? Are they really bought into your credit union and performing at high levels? Or are they bored? Are they apathetic? Are they going through the motions? Because you can have both. I like this quote by John Maxwell. Growth stops when you lose the tension between where you are and where you could be. So if your executives reach this level in their professional life, but they're capable of this, then not only does their professional growth stop, but the growth of your credit union stops as well. John Maxwell has a, a law in, in his 21 books on uh, 21 laws on leadership it's called the law of the lid and the law of the lid says you can only grow at the rate or to the level at which your leadership can lead that's why just because they're executives they can't stop growing and we're going to talk about that so what is this epidemic or the unspoken problem at the top in a, a Gallup does a research on the American workforce and they found out that only 36 percent of American executives are really engaged and passionate about their work. So what does that mean for you? If the statistics bear out in your credit union, two-thirds of the folks on your executive team are disengaged going through the motions. Now I hope that doesn't describe your particular credit union but keep in mind, these are nationwide statistics, and it could very well be the case. And sometimes these folks can hide it pretty well. The, the tough thing about that is that 70% of uh, the variability in employee performance depends on their direct supervisors. So in any given uh, credit union, if two-thirds of the executives are checked out, What's that going to be for the employees, right? And when we talked about velocity previously, think about, what, think about how that is a velocity reducer, right? So this is something for volunteers to be vigilant about. Profile of a disengaged executive. They just look like anybody. They could come to work in a suit and tie, nice and tidy, but oftentimes, they're plateaued, they're bored, they've reached the, their, what they think 
is their peak level. They feel like they have nowhere else to go. Sometimes they feel like there is no place they'd like to go higher, but there's no place in the credit union for them to, to go to. And so we're going to talk about uh, how to uh, change some of that. Sometimes uh, executives don't have a big picture cause to motivate them. And we'll talk about a unified executive team. But if I'm leading my department and you're leading your department and this person over here is leading their department and there's no cohesiveness to what we do, we're not invested together, then I'm just an island to myself coming to work every day, punching the clock, and I don't really have a cause uh, to, other than just getting a salary to work for. So what are some key principles of, of executive development? First of all, don't assume that everything is well just because they're the CFO or just because they're the CEO. They could be on cruise control. They could, in the back of their mind, really want to be doing something very different, okay? The other thing is they want to perform at high levels, but they need to keep growing. So keep, they need to keep pushing, even if you're 20, 25, 30 years into your career. You owe it to the rest of your teammates to keep growing and keep pushing yourself. I guarantee you, you have not maxed out your potential even at that stage of a career. So uh, helping your executives reach their full potential is the greatest gift you can give to them. Kim, we talked about incentives. <laughs> Sorry. We talked about incentives and what's in it for them. Well, what's in it for me is, is if you help me keep growing and keep uh, invigorated with my work. Okay, and then is the credit union committed to them? So there needs to be, a, 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 in terms of helping me grow, getting new positions, uh, launching new product lines, we'll talk a little bit about that. Are you giving me new opportunities? I'm going to talk now about six ways that are, uh, you can help your CEO maximize his or her own performance as well as those individuals on their executive team. And, and some of them, you'll notice, uh, some of them are, are overlapping with what we talked about in the high velocity credit union presentation. Because what we're doing now is we're, we're looking at a, at a sort of a, a smaller system that's designed to keep executives engaged and provide velocity. So uh, we want a strong uh, purpose and strategy a unified executive team. That's very important. We'll discuss that. Um, also, a commitment to the people development process. Leaders are in the people development business. You as volunteers, you're in the credit union business, but you're in the people development business. And organizations that keep that at the forefront really do well. We're going to talk about leadership development plans getting people new assignments, and having that CEO lead by example. Clearly identifying your corporate strategy. We talked a little bit about that, uh, but what I want to say is almost 50% of American managers don't know what their company stands for, according to Gallup research. That's incredible, isn't it? It's amazing. I like what Donna Bland uh, said down here. We stay focused by keeping our vision and mission in front of us all the time with very specific strategic goals we've laid out with you guys here in the room. Our core values are spelled out. I communicate them constantly. So number one in keeping exec executives engaged is clear identification of where you're going. Clarity is so key. And we talked about in the last presentation the eight pillars of strategic alignment. I won't elaborate on that here other than this quote by the CEO of uh, the nation's third largest credit union. He said, knowing who you are is the most important thing. Isn't that amazing? Knowing who you are. He said, I can't be everything to everybody. Knowing who you are. We have to ensure that everyone from the board to the line know where the organization is going. And I just want to reiterate, as I said previously, this is the most important slide that I can give you right here, the eight pillars 
of strategic alignment that keeps everybody on the same page provides clarity and that's what your executive team needs so building the next component of the six building the executive team around unified goals so look if if i am the cfo and i'm on the executive team i can say my primary team is finance and accounting i take care of finance and accounting for my credit union i go to these executive committee meetings uh, once a month or so once a week and they're really boring i just put my time in but i really don't feel like we're connecting uh, as as a team at the executive committee level that happens more often than you might realize if we if the ceo and the board can somehow make that executive team for that CFO the primary team that they're engaged with. So that as one uh, CEO told me, all my senior executives share the same goals and priorities. We, this creates a strong team environment where no one wants to be the weak link. So he likened it to a football team to where there's a tight end, there are as a quarterback, halfback, um, offensive line, different positions, all going toward the end zone. And so that's what the executive team has to be. And if you want to read a great book uh, about this topic, I really uh, recommend this gentleman here, Patrick Lencioni. He has a book called The Advantage. It's about organizational health. It's fantastic. And you'll do your, your uh, executive team a great service if you read that and, t and discuss that with them. I mentioned being in the people development business and how executives still need to be developed. I'm gonna tell you a story a little bit later in this presentation of a CFO who was mentored by his CEO and then became the CEO when that CEO retired. So that's the people development business. So we're gonna, uh, I'll tell you a little story about that, but how do you do that? Well, in my experience, it's by getting to know people. It's by getting to one-on-one -on -one meetings with them, not just to talk about business, but what's important to them. Where do they want to go in their career? And then here's something that we're going to camp out on for just a little bit. Require and measure professional development plans, even for your CEO. You should be requiring this of your CEO. And we're going to discuss it in greater detail in a, in a few minutes. We talked about in the, the high velocity presentation about leadership development. So your CEO and your leadership team need to be developing leaders around them. And here is a formal leadership development process. What exactly occurs here? Well, in this credit union, their leaders get taught on how to develop strategy, how to innovate, how to develop people, technical skills, innovation. Let's say you have a small credit union. Okay, let's say that your credit union is 30 million and you don't feel like maybe you can do this. Well, get with your league and they can help you. They can band together either uh, geographically, regionally. You can collaborate with other credit unions uh, around Ohio and, and have these kinds of workshops. Uh, we talked about, I will talk about in a couple slides more um, about this development plan and being monitored and accountable. Okay, your executives have to be held accountable for their own professional development and it helps if your human resources department can develop a database uh, and in terms of keeping the performance appraisals of where each executive is in terms of their development plan. Challenge executives with new assignments. So uh, I got to a point uh, probably 20 years into my career where I liked doing what I was doing, but I was kind of bored. And so as we go along in our careers, we have to keep reinventing ourselves as we plateau. Well, you can either realize that and get in front of that and help your executives do that and give them new assignments, 
whether it's a product launch, the launch of a new business unit, um, something outside their window that they, that they do day to day. What you don't want to have happen is for somebody at the top of the, the organization to show up day after day, year after year, do the same thing over and over and over and over again. You want new ideas and innovation out of them and you want to keep them fresh. I like requiring innovation. Uh, innovation, as I said previously, is the lifeblood of your credit union. There's a management uh, professor named Peter Drucker. Have you heard of him? Um, he got to be almost 100 years old, was writing books well into his 90s. And he said that the two main functions of a business are innovation and marketing. Everything else is a cost. So innovation needs to be re a requirement on your executive team. Don't let them get away with the same old, same old year after year. And I like this down here, equipping them to coach and mentor their direct reports. Let me tell you a story uh, uh, that I referenced earlier. The CFO, his name, or the CEO I'm talking about, his name is Tony Boudet. He's the CEO of uh, University Federal Credit Union in Austin, Texas. He's a, he, we've become friends. He was the CFO. The CEO came to him and said, uh, Tony, I think you've got the capability of becoming a CEO, but you lack people skills. You're so analytical all the time and you're so uh, numbers oriented and you're just so focused in on finances. If you just lightened up a little bit and took a broader view of people, I think you could someday become the CEO. And I would like, if you want to, I would like to help you do that. So that CEO mentored Tony for about five years until the, the mentoring CEO retired. Tony is now a wonderful CEO, one of the most respected in the whole credit union movement. And it's all because somebody equipped him and he was coached and mentored. It's a pretty, discipleship exactly. It's a pretty powerful story. And by the way, let's just go back to this. This is a great quote. High performing executives are rewarded, not financially, but in what makes them tick. When they're free to use their intellect to establish visions for the credit union and their division that move the organization in the direction it desires, right? So remember that uh, the eight pillars of strategic alignment, that's the strategic framework, that's the playing field that we're working in as a credit union. But if you let me as an executive free to create and to innovate within that playing field, so I know the direction that we're going and I know the boundaries and I can create, that is very rewarding for me and you're gonna get a lot of productivity out of me. So I've mentioned executive uh, personal development plans a few times and I'm just going to give you an overview of what one is. First of all, let's identify strengths. Now I've, I've talked about strengths previously. What are my strengths? You know, there are some things as a manager I'm really good at and some things I just stink at and don't want any part of. Well, if I can just get some support in those things that I'm not so good at and really focus on, on my strengths, we're going to take it forward with high velocity, okay? The, the, my department that I lead. 360 degree reviews. Anybody ever heard of those? Right? A 360 degree review is when it's not just my direct supervisor evaluating me. And I'm not just getting their feedback but I'm getting feedback from my direct reports, from people in the organization who don't report to me, uh, from my peers on the leadership teams across the organization. I'm getting input from all angles of my performance so that we can review those and I can get better. So we're talking about um, personal development plans, 360 degree review. 
understand that executive's passion and goals, where they want to go in their career, and find out where are you now, where do you want to go, and how are we going to close that gap. And I've talked about accountability. So how are we going to measure whether or not you, let's say, the CEO. How are we going to measure CEO whether or not you're achieving the goals that you set out? Well, we're, because we're going to have uh, specific goals, uh, specific actions, and a specific time frame, and we, the volunteers, are going to hold you accountable. So I like this quote also by John Maxwell, to reach your potential, you must grow. Let me tell you, nobody in here has reached their potential. I just guarantee it. You've got much more that you can contribute. But to grow, you have to be intentional. It can't be on autopilot, not even at the executive level. Let's talk about that CEO, leading by example. So why would I require my executive team to have personal development plans, and I'm not going to do one? That doesn't seem right to me. So we have to, we have, to have one. Uh, I've been appalled when I've seen, uh, I talked to an executive recruiter in the credit union space. He said about two thirds of all CEOs are hired from outside the credit union. That means there's no succession plan. If you have a leadership development uh, plan actively engaged and in place, you'll be able to, this succession planning will be easier. You're more likely to have that CEO come from within, that new CEO and other senior leaders. Then there's also the CEO should be having, creating a credit union transformation plan. What in the world is that? A credit union transformation, uh, you know, everybody knows that we're competing, the financial services industry is competing at light speed. Things are changing so, so fast right now. So how am I going to transform my credit union with the help of the board into what it needs to be? So that's back to the eight pillars of strategic alignment and the strategy portion of it. How do I transform my credit union, modernize it, technology, meet new member uh, expectations or increased level of expectations? What's my plan for the credit union of 2025 as the Filene research talked about, I think it was released uh, maybe last summer. Um, how am I going to transform it? And then when I talk to CEOs, uh, this is often an aha for them. They say, you mean I have blind spots? I didn't think about blind spots. Well, everybody has blind spots, right? If I come from a financial background, I might have a blind spot on operations. If I come from an operations background or, or a lending background, I might have a blind spot with respect to marketing. So how can you help your CEO identify and remediate those blind spots? Your CEO needs your help. And, and first of all, in acknowledging that he or she does have blind spots. And second of all, how do we give them the support that they need? And then I talk to CEOs about what do you want your legacy to be? After you've retired, what do you want your former uh, employees and board members to say about you? And this is a question you can be asking your CEO. And that's part of their development plan. What do you want folks to be saying about you after your five, 10, 15 years past retirement? I like uh, this quote by Rodney Shomar. He's from Little Rock, Arkansas, and he is a CEO there. You've got to be learning and developing yourself all the time. This is a CEO saying that. You have to put yourself in situations that make you uncomfortable and nervous. Lead by example. So I question, a question to you is, are, is, are you challenging your CEO and his or her executive team to put themselves in spots that are uncomfortable, that aren't just the same old, same old, that are pushing uh, the boundaries of, of innovation, for example, and the new demands of, of members. 
Now this is a little bit of an ugly slide, but it is the journey of one CEO. Uh, Tony Boudet, whom I referenced before, gave this to me. And this, this is a, a picture of his development of a, as a CEO, starting in the year 2000 all the way up through 2013, going through four distinct phases. Initially, he was a do CEO. He's doing everything. And then as he matured uh, as a CEO, he started letting go of things. Well, now I'm, I'm just making the most important decisions. Well, at this phase now, I am delegating. We've restructured, and now I'm letting my executive team make those decisions. And now I'm more in the people development business. So, and, and now uh, at stage four, I'm working more collaboratively with my board. I've learned how to do that, right? So it'd be interesting, wouldn't it, if you were to take, to have your CEO chronicle his or her journey as CEO and see if they can, they can identify distinct phases and ask them, are you a do-it-all CEO, a doer, doer, doer? Or have you learned to let go? Are you learning to develop people? Are you learning to create some of the leadership systems that we've talked about today? Now, at, at Tony's stage, it's gotten a little bit complicated because now not only is he he's split a third of his time in the credit union, a third of his time with CUNA and in other uh, industry organizations, and then a third of his time in leadership roles within the Austin community. And so as as volunteers, you say, well, how do I measure that? How do I evaluate that performance? That's what his board is grappling with right now. As the CEO becomes more dynamic and, and develops leaders and the, the credit union grows, how do I continue to evaluate that, that CEO's performance? Because what I'm evaluating him on today might be really uh, history, ancient history in terms of what he or she is doing now. So here's a, a leadership intensive model that you can utilize here in Ohio uh, within your own credit union uh, together. But this is kind of the, the role, uh, the model that different CEOs uh, that I've spoken with have gone through. And that is they, they go to a leadership retreat and they develop their succession plan, their personal development plan. And it might be with, with 10 colleagues, either within their own credit union or CEOs that are, that are peers in a state, for example. Then they get back together for encouragement and accountability. How are you doing with your plan? Because, you know, it's really easy to get sucked into and caught up into the day-to-day -day operations of management and all the fires and the... The, the critical things that need to be done day by day, and you forget about the strategy piece. You forget about the development piece. And so you scramble to get it done at the last minute. But if you're being held accountable with a group of colleagues, then you're more likely to get it done. And, and you all can hold them accountable to it. Some folks like monthly peer groups, and some CEOs I've uh, spoken with have one-on-one -on -one professional coaching. And one guy that I want to mention in particular is another fellow from Austin, Paul Trilko, from Amplify Federal Credit Union. Now, he decided in his CEO journey that he had more in him, and so he hired an executive coach. And he saw a great improvement in his performance. And, and so he said, well, hey, if it worked for me, I bet it'll work for folks on my executive team. So he did that. Then they created the leadership development program that I've described to you today. And in five years, they've grown remarkably. And he attributes at least some of it to uh, the, the develop in leadership bench strength that they have right now. Let me just um, summarize this by saying, what are the benefits of a supercharged executive team? There's nothing greater that can happen besides the velocity that I mentioned previously, and velocity comes from a supercharged executive team. No greater way to achieve your, your vision, 
uh, you've got to believe in the potential of each of your executives. And I want you to consider the opportunity cost of doing nothing. Consider the opportunity cost of not developing your executives, of not having any kind of formal leadership development. We talked about velocity previously, the rate at which your credit union is moving toward its goals. Well, you want, you, you want to reach your goals sooner than later. If you do nothing about leadership development, that is a great drag on velocity. So Rodney from uh, Little Rock says, we'll be successful because there's an executive team of overachieving geniuses, he calls them, that want to change the world and can't be stopped. So I'll leave you with a, uh, a story, a brief story, uh, summarizing. Uh, back in the Old Testament, there was a guy named Nehemiah. And uh, he uh, came, he was an Israelite, but he lived in Persia. And he had a job with the Persian king. And somehow he found out that uh, the city that he came from, Jerusalem, was in shambles and that his culture was demolished. So instead of just uh, saying, well, I've got to, that, that's just too bad. I hope somebody does something about that. He took the bull by the horns. He said, I'm going to be the one. And so he created a team of leaders. He got people energized and they rebuilt the city and rebuilt the culture. I want to challenge you that your situation is very similar. The position that you're in is very similar as not for profits, as contributors to your communities. You can do great things in your communities. You don't want to leave any potential on the table. And so that's why you want a supercharged executive team. And you can do that if you hold them accountable and you take the steps that we talked about today. So thank you all very much. It's great to be in Ohio.